uh, when I ordered something, I was thinking, you know, delivery packages. Hmm. You know, how does that? How did that start? You know, what is the history of it? I always like to go to the roots of uh, something that uh, happened or someone who's come or something. And uh, I, I thought, let's go to the uh, let's go to the origin of delivery packages, right? So before Amazon and all these online things came, who used to deliver your packages? Yes, the USPS, right? Yeah, but it used to take days, I guess. You know, I was not here. I don't know. But it used to take days and months, probably, to deliver one package, right? Uh, but you'll be amazed to know that delivery packages or package delivery started way back in 1860 or 1861, okay? The history of delivery packages started in 1860 to 1861. And uh, how did it start? There was something called as Pony Express, yeah? Pony Express. And uh, one day, uh, Alexander uh, Majors, yeah, Alexander Majors, you know, he, he wanted to deliver a letter in 10 days, okay, which was impossible at the time. Impossible. Because it would take months from, let me see, uh, St. Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento. It would take months and months to deliver one letter. Okay? But this Alexander Majors decided, I want to do it in 10 days. So what did he do? He put, he put a team together, 120 riders, 184 stations, 400 horses, okay, and several hundred assistants. And then each rider would get a small Bible, and he had to, he, he had to take this oath called, by the help of God, I will deliver, okay? And uh, uh, he was supposed to overcome all difficulties on the road, because it was not easy. It was very hard, difficult, dangerous, you know, for one person to go, you know, during that time it was all woods, right? So people used to drive horses, they used to get mugged all the time, and uh, theft was common. So they, so they came together and they were given a Bible in their hand and they were asked to take an oath by the help of God. Um, and so this Pony Express started. One, one instance that, one advertisement that caught my attention. Listen to this. One advert, advertisement for jobs, okay? In the Pony Express said, wanted young, skinny, wiry fellows not over 80. <laughs> okay? Must be expert riders willing to risk death daily. Listen to this, orphans preferred. It said orphans preferred. Wanted young, skinny, wiry fellows who were not 80, must be expert riders willing to risk death, daily orphans preferred, right? Sounds like cowboys to me, isn't it? Some Texan cowboy, you know, I can picture somebody, you know, uh, who, is, who is strong and brave. But it says skinny fellows, you know, who can get away with things or escape. You know, they were paid, what, $100 per month? And uh, if you go to find the history of this, uh, these riders, you won't find any of the names. Okay, almost all the names are gone, and there is an uh, untarnished record of this uh, young man. And I was thinking, you know, just last Christmas uh, I saw this Facebook meme. Uh, sorry to break the bubble of the children, but <laughs> these are the real Santa Clauses. And I saw UPS truck and Amazon truck and USPS truck. You know, all these people delivering gifts and um, they don't eat the cookies or drink the milk, you know, <laughs> Santa does. But, uh, but th these are the real Santas we call. Them. And we don't know, you know, what they go through. I was look uh, it was a snow day in, in December last year and I did not expect my package to arrive. But at 8 in the night, I saw my package was delivered, you know. And I said, God bless these people. They care for everybody, 
isn't it? Of course, they get the uh, extra money for the overtime to work and everything. But look at the commitment that people have, you know, to deliver packages. Package deliverers are so awesome. But on our end, it feels good to be delivered, isn't it? It feels good to be delivered. It feels good to be delivered. You know, in the Bible, there are so many people who are discussed. And today what we are going to see is a man who did not live long, but he had a calling. A calling to be a deliverer. And he lived to that calling. Let us pray before we go into this. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful to you for giving us the gift of scripture, so. As we go into it, let your Holy Spirit take control. As we study, let your will be done and not ours. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's go to Judges chapter 3, verse 7 to 11. Okay? Judges chapter 3, verse 7 to 11. The Bible says, I'm reading from the New King James Version. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. Okay? See the, see the one thing that uh, happens. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Very important for our story today. Uh, verse 8. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. One very common thing that I see in this verse and one other verse. Keep your finger on this verse and go to Daniel chapter 1 verse 1. Okay? Keep your uh, finger on this verse, verse 8 and Daniel chapter 1 verse 1. What does it say? Verse 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Okay? And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God. Let, let's read uh, jo, uh, Judges uh, 3 and 8 once again. Therefore the anger of the Lord was fought against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan, king of Mesopotamia. Okay? Let's go to Daniel Chapter 1 and verse 2 again. Let's do this exercise till you get it. Okay? What does it say? Can somebody read aloud? And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Whose hand? Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. You see, when people did not believe in the Lord anymore, when people were not faithful anymore, when people did not have that focus anymore, the Lord Himself gave His people to Satan's people, to the enemy's people. Okay? When our faith is no more in whom we believe, what, was, what did the Israelites do? Israelites do to be delivered into the hands of this king of Mesopotamia? What did they do? They worshipped Baal. Yes, they worshipped Baal and all this, all, all these gods. So one point that I made here is, if we are not going to be faithful, okay, and we still expect answers from someone we did not know for a long time, God Himself is going to give us to the enemy. Very strong words, but a concept to be considered. Faithfulness to the Lord is very necessary. We are in which book? Judges, right? And if you see Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Joshua, did God change? No. Did the people change? Yes. You know, it is, it is worthwhile to notice that when technology 
and when science and knowledge takes over God on the other side is the same he does not change our thinking changes and so what do we do we assume that he does not exist we assume that there is more than God we assume things that are not supposed to be assumed I was challenged when uh, last year I never saw this uh, let me make this confession I never saw this community before I never heard of this community before um, and but from the time I came here uh, I, I was listening uh, I was hearing and listening and learning about this community and I went to Pennsylvania okay you know whom I'm talking about I'm talking to the Amish community okay and the first word came to me is crazy <laughs> this is crazy because they don't believe in technology even the lamps of their homes you know are naturally lit you're from Pennsylvania brother Joel right you must have seen them carpenters yeah I I was amazed by the way they live and when asked that is how God wants us to live they say and that is how that's that's focused now I'm not saying everybody should be like that or something but look at how the community is focused on something you know on God's commands on on how it is to be lived so that their focus from God is not gone you know someday if their focus changes from God to tradition changes will take place you know that is inevitable but what I'm trying to say is when you are faithful to God you can have a progress of your studies in God but do not say that just because this study makes sense God does not make sense because God will take his intellectual have you heard about the parable of the talents right when the owner takes the talents and gives it, gives it to somebody else God will take it and give it to somebody else and it will not make sense to you anymore sitting in the center of the church reading the gospel but it will not make it make sense anymore if we take our God from our equation of life okay let's let's read further it says when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them Othniel the son of Canaan, Caleb's younger brother okay who was Caleb Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua. What did Caleb do? Mm. Need to read the Bible more. After Moses died. Yes. Yeah. So Caleb was a minor prophet. Right? And he also was a spy. Right? Now, look at this. God entrusts his people with different talents. Okay, Caleb did not tell uh, Othniel that I am a prophet, you also ought to be a prophet. Right? That I am following Joshua, you also follow Joshua. But God chose Othniel, Caleb's brother, for a different work. Okay? You might say that you are here and you are supposed to, what you are supposed to do, even others are supposed to do the same thing. But God calls everyone for a different calling. Right? He calls you to be something different. He calls you to reach people in a different way. Now Caleb was also called to reach people in a different way. But Othniel, his calling was much more than that. Right? Let's go. Let's go to the next word. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war and the Lord delivered Cush and Rishathan, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. So the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Very short story. Right? Just a little life. My message today is very simple, brothers and sisters. How much you live does not matter. How you live the calling of your life matters. Othniel, he, he waged the war, he lived his calling, 
He delivered the people. And what did he do? He died. The story in this passage, he is a warrior. Though his story is small, his story is great. Now think about delivery packages once again. When a package is delivered to you, you feel great, isn't it? The website says the package will come on Wednesday, February 9th and it arrives between 8 to 10 a.m. It will arrive between 8 to 10 a.m. and it arrives at 9.25, right? The deliverer did his job so well. And then the text comes to you, an email comes to you, your package has been delivered, this, that. It feels great to be delivered, isn't it? Now I'm talking in Christian context. We felt great to be delivered when Jesus delivered us from our sins. It feels great to be a part of a plan which is eternal. Not just two days, five days, or 50 years. Even when I sleep in the grave, I knew before I died that I'm going to live eternally. Now, are we package deliverers? God has given His package, the Bible to us, the Word to us, His knowledge to us, His plan of redemption to us. How are we acting? How does the package deliverer's uh, uh, job start? How does it start? He accompanies another package deliverer, right? And then what does is, what is it what does happen? Uh, what does he do? He trains that person, right? But does that person remain in training forever? No. no. He has to take the wheel one day, right? And over 500 boxes are on his responsibility. He has to go out and deliver. Each and every package should be exact, not torn, not uh, broken, right? Otherwise it affects the employee. You and I, we are something like that. Church is a place where we come to receive God's message. Okay? But we ought not to make this a club. Okay? And remain here. Oh, God has been good to us. Okay? Let's sing in our community and let's talk in our community and that's it. That's my calling. No, that's not your calling. The calling of God is like Othniel. You are sent here to deliver somebody. You've got to get out of your training and deliver somebody. It doesn't matter which company you, you, you belong to. You belong to the Dorcas company or you belong to the evangelism company. It does not matter what calling you have. It is to fulfill your calling. Because we never know, you know, we, we drive 65 miles per hour, 55 miles per hour, and we hear the news every day that somebody got into an accident and died on the spot, right? It's a fact of life. It may happen to us, but when that moment hits, naturally or disastrously, will you go back and say, I accepted the Lord and lived for Him? As we, as we look back at life, Maybe at this very moment, it does not have to be a tragic moment like death, but at this very moment, did I reach somebody with a message of delivery? My message today is very short, and so this is a small example I want to give you. We all know Isaac Newton, right? Sir Isaac Newton, a great scientist. You know, when I was growing up, I used to love his formulas. And you know, all the stories that he had. And when I grew up, I learned that Sir Isaac Newton was not an atheist. Sir Isaac Newton had written books on Daniel and Revelation. Volumes on Daniel and Revelation, which were used by William Miller. 
which were used by William Miller to study prophecy. So not only he had scientific achievements, but he had also religious achievements. In every area he excelled. He did great and till today we know him. But did you know that Sir Isaac Newton was not supposed to live when he was born? The doctors at the time said at the most five to ten hours. The size of his body was like the palm of my hand. He was not supposed to live. But Sir Isaac Newton became one of the greatest achievers in history, in science, in religion. What is your calling? It is up to you. But I living up to that calling is the question of life. Whether being the light of God, are we living? You know, Christ calls his brothers such a high privilege, isn't it? He does not call us that he, he is God and we are here and he's there. No. He calls us brother. He calls us somebody who is close to him. And to prove that a holy life can be lived, he came down to earth. Don't you think all this deal would have been taken care of in heaven itself? But he came down to make sure. And in all this story, Christ is typified. Look at him. Did Israelites cry for a long time for a savior? Did or did not? Right? Did the Jews cry or no? They did. They were looking for signs, wonders. They used to go to this soothsayers and everybody. When is the savior coming? And in the same way, when these people were under the king of Mesopotamia, what happened? People prayed, God, give us a deliverance. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you a fact. You may be the answer to someone's prayers. You just, you just, doesn't, you just don't know about your calling. You may be the answer to somebody's prayers. Lord, in our field, we want to deliver it. Lord, in our community, we want to deliver. Are you that author? The question lies with every, not just the Seventh-day Adventist believer, but every person who says, I believe in Christ, he carries a name, a responsibility. To reach in the community, to reach in your class, if you're a student, to reach at your workplace, to reach at somewhere where people are unreached, God is calling all of us. But the way we live, even till death, right? We are married to Christ as a church, isn't it? He is the bridegroom, we are the bride, right? What does the vow say? Till death, do us our Right? How are we living? Are we living our life as a challenge? You know, one, one theology professor in my class, I always use this phrase, he used to tell me, a pastor's work is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> you know? It's, it, to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. What is afflict the comfortable? If everything is okay in your life, and if your life is normal, something is wrong with your life. No. A Christian's life is never normal because a Christian's life is always special. It's never normal. Does your neighbor know about Jesus? Does your colleague know about Jesus? Does your community know about the plan of redemption? Does people, do people know about what a savior is? What Jesus is all about. Does your, say, does your neighbor know your story? Does your neighbor know your testament? Does your neighbor know how you got that money for tuition? Does your neighbor know how you got that mortgage paid off? Do people know how you got rid of cancer? Do the people know 
how something happened which is now called medical miracle. Are you the author of your life? That is the question. As you ponder upon the question, remember, the time is very little. Now don't think in the human context, okay? Oh, I've been hearing this for the last 40 years, 50 years, as long as I've been here. You know, your time and God's time does not match sometimes. When we say the time is little, okay? The time is little where you can preach, where you can talk, where you can share your life testimony, the word of God, or the things that God can do in somebody's life. And before that time is up, and you've got to get rid of this world, we must live our calling. May God call the orphanel in your life today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we close our service, Let's, uh, let's all stand and sing hymn number 375, number 375.